Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar this week. I'm Liz Mangus, Literacy Specialist with Saddleback Educational Publishing. As usual, we have a great session planned for you today. As you are logging in, please locate your control bar on the bottom of your web browser window. That is where you will find the chat, the Q&A, and the live transcript options. We will be utilizing the chat today. So if you could all do me a favor and go there right now, click on it, go ahead and select everyone from the dropdown. Uh, if you do that now, it'll stay that way and you won't have to worry about it later on. Uh, that this will ensure that everybody participating today can see your comments. So go there right now, select everyone from the drop down, and just let us know where you are uh, joining us from today. As you have questions, go ahead and drop those in the Q&A area, and we will get to those uh, as we can today. And then if you would like to take advantage of subtitles, you need to select live transcript and then click on show subtitle. We'll get started right at three o'clock Eastern time. We're on Twitter but you know that already. So uh, Saddleback is on Twitter and Orly, our presenter is on Twitter as well. So go ahead and um, follow us, say hello, let everybody know you are joining us today. Let's do a time check. Yeah, we got a couple of minutes. So um, hi, Orly. Hi, excited How are to you be today? here. <laughs> I am great, I'm excited to be here. Excited to talk um, about grading. Oh yes, we. this is such a great topic, especially for this particular audience that you're focusing in on. Um, this is one that I think people really wonder about and it's going to be a great conversation today. Um, yeah. And thank you for doing this because this is one we haven't done. We did a, a grading one, a grading and assessment one, but it was a while back. So it's it's been a while since we've uh, had, a, had a conversation about this. Um, let's yeah, see I'm excited. Here. We have uh, Roberts here, welcome back. Tim Melba from Round Rock, Antonio, nice to see you from Tomball ISD. Um, we have Maria from New Mexico, uh, Susanna from Indiana, Emily from Annapolis. This is great, thanks. Keep it coming, everybody. Let us know where you are joining us from. And uh, this, and don't forget to select everyone from the drop down. In fact, I need to do that right now as well because I spend two minutes every week telling everybody to do this and I forget <laughs> to do it too. So I'm just gonna say, hi, there we go. Now I am all set for when I need to chat later on. <laughs> so how are you doing today? Everything fine where you are, Orly? Everything's great. We're expecting snow apparently, which I have mixed feelings about. I love, I love snow and we were living in Florida for some time. So there was no snow for a little while. Um, but when you live in a place without snow and then you move back to a place with snow, you forget about the shoveling and the just the whole process, the salt, the just, you know, so uh, I have very mixed feelings about the snow. <laughs> yes. Um, the one thing that um, I, I grew up in a very cold, snowy climate, but I've lived here in Texas for a long time. And the one thing that gets me every time is when I go back for the holidays and I visit with people, if it's snowy, I you have to plan time into your day, got to brush yeah. the snow off the car. You have the warming up of the car, lived yeah. my whole life with the, the warming up of the car. And then I forget about it. You know, when I go up for holidays, I'm like, oh, I'm going to be 10 minutes late. Cause I forgot to factor in. I need to brush yeah. the snow off the car. And yeah, yeah. it's, um, it's a lifestyle. Can, it, is, it, is, it is definitely a lifestyle. And I also, I like, I, I, even this morning I was like out the door and I was like, oh, it's really cold. I probably should have heated up the car first. Um, but whatever, oh. you know, I just, it, 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 you know, I survived, we're fine, you know, but, yes. uh, oh my gosh. Yeah. I, it's like you, when you move to a different climate, you really forget. Yes, you do. You know, you really what forget. that's like. Yeah. I also, mm -hmm. I really forgot what it's like when like the temperatures really drop and it's like real feel of seven degrees, you know, it's like you forget that bitter bone cold. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just really different. So it is still really adjusting, different. still adjusting. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you know what, there is something to be said for getting that um, change of seasons uh, yeah. when you live in that area, which is really beautiful. And yeah. Um, okay, well, it is time to start. So we know our topic today is growth based grading. Uh, really, really excited to have this conversation today. I think it's going to be a really nice learning opportunity to examine our 
beliefs and the purpose uh, of grading and kind of talk about how this can all apply with our multilingual learners. To lead us in this conversation today, we have, of course, Ms. Orly Klappholtz, and she is the founder and CEO of Inlier Learning. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, so she focuses on innovative solutions for students with limited and interrupted formal education in the work that she does, um, including having conversations uh, like the one we're about to have today around uh, grading and what that all means. So uh, once again, thank you for joining us, and I'll let you take it from here. Great. Thank you, Liz. Thank you to the Saddleback team. I'm going to share my screen. Here we go. Let's get over here. Whoops. Let's get over here. Here we go. Okay. Um, just taking this. All right. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon or evening uh, to those who are joining us from all over. Uh, thank you uh, to the Saddleback team again for having me today. It is always a pleasure to do these webinars and to be here and always um, a pleasure to work with you. And I'm very excited to have this conversation about growth mindset grading and growth uh, based grading in general, uh, especially for our multilingual population. It is one that I've had for many, I think every year uh, throughout the year, um, as I was teaching multilingual learners, it is certainly a complex and nuanced topic and one that should just be continuously revisited and something that we're, uh, you know, starting now and even maybe thinking about for next school year, what we take away from here today, what can help us facilitate those conversations. Um, I have a few questions for the chat. So if you could keep the chat open um, and then Liz, if you wouldn't mind, uh, you know, letting me know some of those answers uh, throughout, uh, we're gonna ask a few questions and we'd love some participation from the crowd joining us today. So let, we're gonna start off with what type of grading system did each of you who is joining us today experience in school? Could have been portfolio or letter number system, a pass fail system, or it could have been some other system. Um, but I would love to know what type of grading system you experienced. It could have been at any point of your schooling. Letter number seems to be the most common answer right now. All right, there we go. Yeah, that's. I'm not surprised. Um, I also experienced uh, the letter number system. Everything was either how many points did you get on a test um, and then, or maybe a project uh, or we would get, I would get um, a letter grade. And I remember that distinctly in every class, uh, particularly high school. I don't remember that as much elementary or, um, or middle as much, but I really remember that in high school. And I don't remember uh, as a high school student, I don't remember knowing what any of that meant other than it was just out of 100, right? So um, I might be aging myself right now, but for anyone who may have experienced the Scantron test, which uh, for those who didn't experience it, uh, was is a multiple choice. You just bubble it in kind of like SATs and the teachers would just put it through the machine and you would just get however many right or wrong. Um, many of my high school tests were Scantron tests, um, multiple choice. Uh, and many of the essays uh, that I wrote um, or just written responses were also either uh, a letter uh, a letter grade or a number grade. And actually, I was recently um, uh, called by my parents that it was time to clean out uh, my room and all of the things from my educational career that I was still holding on to, including old essays. Um, and I was looking through it because I was curious, you know, how that like, what did I gain from this? And I looked at so many of them from so many different teachers who had so many different grading systems. And I remember, and, and I was thinking about how I couldn't have possibly understood as a student what any of that meant. Like, why did this feedback mean it was, let's say, like a C or a B or an A? Um, and so we're gonna we're gonna unpack that a bit today and talk about how even more so for our multilingual students, and then I would even even a step further, our SLIFE students, our, our students with limited or interrupted formal education. Uh, what does it mean to have uh, grading that is more humanizing and more equitable for them? So when we talk about specifically grading challenges for teachers of multilingual students, and, and there are many, uh, and I would say these are really the four um, across the board that I would say are significant challenges that we see, the first being consistency. And we see this with grading, not even just as a challenge for our multilingual students, but just in general in our education system, right? So the teacher who is 
coming, uh, you know, uh, to us from, um, let's see, you know, Philadelphia, where I'm based, right? Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, they have one grading system. And then maybe they're talking to a teacher who teaches the same grade, the same content, but let's say from Broward County, Florida, and they're both talking to each other and they're talking about their students and they're talking about what they've assigned. And, you know, they think they're having conversation about the same thing, but then later they actually find out they're kind of actually talking around each other because they don't have consistent grading. They don't have consistent uh, philosophies on grading. And even within their own system that they thought was the same, it's actually not really consistent. And that's a huge challenge for grading any students, but in particular our multilingual students, uh, because it's, it really shows this huge disconnect uh, between what's going on in one classroom versus another classroom. And then as an education system, we're supposed to kind of look at this bird's eye view of what's going on in general. And are we doing what uh, would be best practices? And so that consistency challenge is really an issue for all students. And again, in particular for our multilingual students. When we think about students, right, equity is not equality. We're not talking about everyone should get the same thing because as I'm sure everyone who is here is very well aware, right? When you have a classroom, let's say I have five newcomers and I have five other students who are multilingual students, but they're not newcomers. And maybe I have another seven students who are their monolingual peers and they're all in one classroom. Even if I decide, right, that I, you know, this assessment is uh, assessing content, for example, if I giving every single person that exact same assessment would really not be equity. Um, and so looking at how humans are nuanced, right? We're all different, we have different needs um, and attending to the really individual needs of those students. How do I do that in a classroom that is so diverse, um, recognizing that our multilingual population is so diverse um, and that we need to make sure that students are getting what they need and that's okay. Uh, perceptions on the purpose of grading. And we're going to spend significant amount of time talking about this is that we really need to unpack what different educators, really education stakeholders uh, view as the purpose of grading, right? Because since we have different views on what the purpose of grading is, that will change how we grade and what we use to grade. And we need to make sure that we have um, more of a general consensus of that purpose. Otherwise, it's not really clear what we're grading and how we're doing it. And then again, differentiation, again, being a challenge, particularly for teachers of multilingual students. We're going to talk about this today. Uh, and I'm gonna show you some things that I did in the classroom and some ways that I've worked with schools on how to shift over to more of um, a growth-based mindset, as well as uh, I would say more of an individualized uh, view of looking at students in terms of differentiating how we grade and knowing that you know, you're part of this larger system. So I'm going to change, uh, I'm not gonna change the whole system, but I'm gonna change structures within the system in order to make it more humanizing and more equitable. This comes from Great Schools Partnership, which um, is an organization that works with schools really to uh, support their development in a lot of different ways, one of them being creating. And the author says that they cannot emphasize strongly enough that getting sidetracked with details of scaling, so letters, percentages, rubrics, right? Like what, what is the, uh, you know, the, the outcome, that outcome grade, I, I'll, I'll say, or policies, right? So how do, uh, what we should do with later missing work? How does that impact a grade or behavior, for example, which we've seen plenty of. Uh, before you tackle the question of what a grade means in the first place, will really lead to trouble. And when I first saw this, it really struck me just how uh, little time is spent talking about what a grade means and really what the purpose is of that grade, right? Or, or of the grading system, I would say in general. And for a lot of my teaching career, and I would say in the very beginning, we really had no conversations about that. Um, and it wasn't until later that I switched schools that that became a typical conversation to have really all the time throughout the school year um, at different points. And I remember thinking, okay, this is really new to me, um, but really feeling that that allowed all of us as teachers to really view our students in a very different way because it's not just about that grade. It's not just about passing the class. It's taking a look at this whole child and taking more of a holistic view of 
what, why am I grading in the first place? Right. And so I'm, it, you know, maybe taking that step back and saying, I'm in this system, right? There, there, there are grades in this system. And now we have to talk about how equitable is it and um, how accessible is it for my multilingual population? And then looking at my classroom practices, looking at my school practices, um, and then having that conversation, that ongoing conversation, because it's a conversation that shouldn't really ever totally come to a stop. I'm curious, I would love to hear from you in the chat, what to you is the point of grading? Or maybe said in a different way, why do you think we should have grades? And your answer could be, we shouldn't have grades. That's that's also uh, you know, a welcome answer. But I would be curious from the participants who are here, why do we grade or what to you is really the point of grading? Okay, hey, I see it's to provide feedback. Okay. Student performance, measuring how they meet the criteria, seeing what the strengths and weaknesses are, uh, to gauge level of understanding. Um, I see the word feedback um, popping up quite a bit. Accountability, um, pro providing a snapshot and how they're doing overall. System accountability. Mm -hmm. Uh, Great, well, thank a type you. of formative assessment. So yeah, lots of good answers. Great, thank you. Yes, and I, I think all this is really important, right? It's also important for us to see each other's answers and because it, it really goes back to, right? Like what is the point of grading? What is the purpose? Um, and before we even go into like, what is the vehicle I'm going to use to grade? It's important for us to have the conversations around what is the purpose, right? And so feedback, for example, right? Um, or or seeing the growth, uh, or maybe if there if we haven't seen growth, right? So um, are they are they hitting those standards, right? Um, accountability as a system. Um, and so everyone, you know, has a little bit of a different answer. Some may have more similar answers. Um, but unpacking that and and making space to be able to unpack that really allows us to then dive into okay, I now know my purpose what is the vehicle to get there? And is the vehicle I'm using to get there, is that uh, not just humanizing and equitable, but is it actually getting me to my purpose? Because sometimes what happens is we decide on what the purpose is for grading, um, but there's a mismatch. Uh, and I would say there's an added mismatch oftentimes for our multilingual learners, where we know there are a range of assessments, right? Are you looking at linguistic development? Are you looking at specifically numeracy or let's say reading content, right? So what is really the purpose here? And then how am I assessing that? Um, and am I assessing that properly? So, you know, they continue, the Great Schools Partnership continues with that idea of saying that, right, that this is really the case of having to look at the main purpose of grades first, right? That, that needs to be discussed first, uh, whether it's one teacher to one teacher or the whole school together um, and really getting on that same page. Uh, and I really appreciate when they say that, you know, if a school decides that academic grades should reflect achievement only, for example, uh, then teachers need to handle missing work in a different way, right? And so when we think about, when you break down kind of what are the policies uh, within grading and then also how I'm grading, uh, you know, the reflecting how do, do both of those things reflect and make sense with with that purpose that I've chosen. And sometimes when we start to unpack that, like I said, we we then start to see a bit of a mismatch. Sometimes it, we think, oh, you know, this makes sense because I, I also want to motivate, let's say, the student to do this one thing. But then when we take a step back, we realize mm, that grading practice may not really make sense because that's actually not what I'm trying to grade. That's not really the purpose of this grade. Um, and she continues on to say that once a school staff gets to this point, there are plenty of resources, right, that they can use, but that the important thing is to examine those beliefs and assumptions about meaning and purpose of grades first, right? Again, why are we doing what we do? Um, and that without that clear sense, it's not really much is gonna happen from there because until we get really clear and consistent across the board, it's a very challenging uh, to then move from there, right? Because then we kind of continue to have these like, talking around each other conversations. Um, and I remember when I was grading for the Regents exam in New York one year, uh, that's exactly what happened. We had to norm with each other um, and really make sure that we were grading on the same page um, and, and really for the same purpose. 
this really resonated with me. Um, and I'm going to uh, tell you a quick story of experience that I had for myself teaching uh, newcomer students. Uh, you know, in, in the book, Fair Isn't Always Equal, Assessing and Grading in a Differentiated Classroom. He says that grading is one of the most bizarre aspects of teaching. And even that sentence, I read it and I thought, yes, it is. Because, you know, you're like sometimes trying to fit a square peg in a round hole and you're kind of trying to make everything work together. And it, it often leaves us with questions of, does this make sense? Am I really grading what I'm trying to grade? Um, and no two teachers grade alike. We see that this is true, right? You could be, you could share classrooms and you could still have two very different grading, um, you know, uh, grading purposes in your classroom and you could have different uh, grading experiences in your classroom. And everyone thinks their way is the best. You know, every, we, we as creatures of habit, we like to grade the way that, or anything, teach, grade, do anything, get up in the morning, make our bed, right? Anything, right? Where we like to do things the way that feel comfortable to us a lot of the time. Um, and when he says though, I, you know, that he's been doing this for 37 years and he's still not happy with the way he grades, does a grade truly reflect what a student has learned? or how hard they tried, or what they're capable of doing. And that really hits home, you know, to that whole conversation of what is the purpose of grading, right? Um, and then are we reflecting that in our practice? Um, when I had, I switched schools, I was originally teaching in one high school, and I switched to another high school that was um, uh, for older adolescent newcomer students. And um, that was the first experience I had really working extreme I mean the whole school works collaboratively with each other um truly collaboratively and it was the first time that uh we were really having whole school and then whole team conversations uh, around grading specifically I had never experienced that before in my teaching career and uh what was really incredible to see was that um it was so top of mind of everyone in the school to make sure that we were assessing students um properly and then grading properly, uh, students completed something at, that was called at that time a DOL, a defensive learning, and they would do that at the end of different semesters. And when they did that, the rubric that was used across the board in the whole school to make sure it was consistent, we spent over a week, I think it was two, maybe even three weeks, hours of norming with each other uh, to make sure that everyone was on the same page. That was really impactful for me because I, as a teacher, had experienced for the first time what it could look like um, to be mindful of that, of mindful of that grading in a very different way to make sure everyone is truly on the same page so that when a student sees a rubric in one person's classroom, it is the exact same in the other person's classroom and they have the same expectations of what they're supposed to do and how they will be graded um, or and what the purpose is. And then what was truly incredible is seeing that being used throughout the year. And so students were given portfolios, which I'm gonna talk about later, um, and then they could really see that growth and they could see the growth and how it was consistent and how the, it wasn't just switching from one class to the other, uh, but teacher to teacher to teacher didn't matter, you know, subject, but in general, you know, this was the rubric, this was the expectation. They were able to follow that along and it was really helpful for students because they could really be mindful and understand what the system was in the school, what their expectations were, um, and then be able to see their growth actively. Um, there was a study done um, called using sliding uh, sliding scale rubrics uh, to motivate struggling learners. This particular study was done with uh, students who had IEPs. Uh, and what was interesting about it is that they showed that using, that there are certain grading practices that are more humanizing, for example, and more equitable, uh, but also again, mindful that there's no grading practice that's perfect, right? So we often want to find a practice uh, whether it's in teaching or or um, in grading or or anything that we do, right? That we're like, this works. And anytime we have this conversation, it has to be nuanced because there is no perfect practice uh, when it comes to grading, right? Or 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 teaching, for example. And so, being able to say, I am going to uh, choose to use this grading practice, or this makes more sense. Uh, for this reason, because it's, let's say, more equitable, uh, while also recognizing that I'm in an imperfect system, this is not a perfect uh, grading system, and I'm still, you know, I'm teaching humans, not robots, and so I have to be mindful of that, no matter what grading system I use. Um, they talk specifically about sliding scale rubrics. For those who do not know uh, what those are, I'm gonna show you in the next slide, uh, but they did find that it motivated, motivated students more because they were able to uh, ask more questions, they were able to better understand, uh, again, how they were being graded and what the expectations were for themselves. And that was really 
interesting to read in the study itself. Uh, and they took student quotes from there also, you know, they, they um, uh, put in the study student quotes uh, and they said that even though there were some students, you know, who still did not um, see the benefit that they had significantly more students who said they did see the benefit and better understood where the teacher was coming from and what was expected of them in general. So a sliding scale rubric, uh, and we're gonna talk about how this really impacts multilingual students, but it's a rubric whose proficiency expectations change over time. And so the purpose of them is to show more equitable grading and it's to align grading practice specifically with a growth mindset. And so oftentimes in education, and I think even more so for those of us who have worked or, or are actively working with multilingual students is talking about the idea of growth mindset right, is that you may not be here yet, but we are getting there, right? We are going to get there. And here are some ways we can show you that maybe we're here now, but let's see where we are in a month from now, right? Let's even see where we are at the end of the week. And so creating and kind of flexing that growth mindset muscle, uh, we see can happen more so with different types of grading practices more than others. This is an example, um, of a sliding scale rubric. Um, you can find this on Google. It, I did not create it. If you Google sliding scale rubric, this will come up as the first PDF. Um, and so you can see from that first term, the first and second term, how students, you can't even get a one in that first and second term. You actually start off by getting a two first, right? And then if you were to hit in that, what would be three range for the third and fourth term, it's actually a four in that first term. So the expectations of what you are uh, or what you're supposed to be able to do at the beginning of the year are not the same as what you would expect someone to be able to do at the end of the year. And so this shows students of like, hey, you may be uh, here right at the beginning of the year. This is what we would expect you to be able to do at the beginning of the year. Look at where we are going to go, right? And that's why this is going to change a bit because this is our expectation of where we're going to go. Why proficiency grading? One of the primary goals of proficiency grading specifically is so that students can learn their progress, they can see their progress, right? It's going to reflect that actual progress. And so no assessment, right, is, or when we assess, I should say, really, is we're looking at that one point in time, right? It's not the entire student just because we did this assessment and it tells me this information about um, a student. But what we can do with progress monitoring specifically and proficiency grading is that if we do that throughout the year, then we're actually able to see and show a student their learning progress and what they've made. When we talk about high stakes testing, right, it is unavoidable. It's where we are. That's what we do. But proficiency grading specifically allows students to actually measure their growth. And this is another way that, again, students can really flex that growth mindset muscle, uh, as well as the flexible thinking muscles in their brain to be able to say, I'm not here yet, right? I'm not here yet, but this is where I'm, I'm going to go. Um, and it's a, it allows them to be able to actually sit down and say, okay, that's, that's where I want to be, right? This is how I'm going to get there. They can create a roadmap or to be able to look back and say, wow, that's where I was look at how far I am now, right? Or again, for teachers to be able to say, you know, I really thought that this student was gonna be here at this point. I wonder what's going on. And it allows for teachers to take a step back and schools take a step back and say, again, right? I'm working with humans, I'm not working with robots. I need to take a look at this, at this child from a more holistic standpoint. I need to take a step back and say, it's not just this moment in time, it's the bigger picture here. And how do we look at this bigger picture for each of, and in particularly our multilingual students? So let's talk about grading specifically for multilingual students. We're gonna now kind of get into the how. And um, you know, I wrote multilingual students specifically SLIFE because I'm gonna show you some very specific examples of using this, particularly with students, as you can see from this uh, graph here, who uh, came into our school um, at the age of 16, 17, 18. And at that point in their home languages uh, were not reading um, and really found yet, not reading yet. And we're not, we're really uh, finding um, numeracy classes as well, particularly challenging. And so the person that I quote on the bot bottom, Sarah Digby, uh, she wrote supporting Latino students with interrupted formal education. And she and I worked uh, together very closely 
she was our uh, home language specialist, really. And she was both studying home language development for students uh, with interrupted education. And she and I teamed up that she did all of the home language assessments and I did all of the English assessments and we like cross, uh, you know, worked with each other. Everything uh, was really in line with each other. And uh, we did this for both SLIFE identification as well as progress monitoring to be able to, uh, you know, see student growth, both for their motivation as well as uh, just in general to keep track of what was going on in terms of academically. And so, um, I'm going to show you some examples from a student who was over here um, in the below K area when they entered our school at the age of 17. And so I'm sure many of you are thinking probably you have students like that who have entered your school uh, or entered your classrooms. And, you know, the first question I think we often get from teachers or, or that I've experienced is, um, OK, now I know where where this student is. I recognize their, you know, this. Again, human, not robot. They come with amazing lived experiences and all these strengths, and um, you know, and, and their wonderful culture that I'm like ready to support. And also, I'm not sure how within this system I'm in of grades what to do. And so that's where we again take the step back and say, well, like let's talk about the purpose of grading first. Why am I giving these grades, right? If it's for feedback, for example, right? Let's use the feedback example. Let's use like even the proficiency, right? Um, the growth mindset. How am I going to help this student see all of that um, and help them to see the purpose in all of it as well, um, as well as make sure that I am, am a I as a teacher am helping the student grow um, academically as well. So this is. Um, well, you're, some of you may have seen this actually from our the uh, first Saddleback webinar I did. Uh, we talked about um, reading foundations for SLIFE specifically, and this is one of the examples that I had shown. And I now it's really in a different context, but showing you how we graded this compared to, let's say, other students who were maybe writing essays at the same time, and they were all in the same class together. And so um, you can see from the left side, so that was July, I was very fortunate that our administration allowed for us to really come to them with innovative ideas um, and they let us run with it. So I had created a uh, class to teach foundations and content first life and then we continued a lot of that during the year. And so this, the beginning of this was really in July when this particular student was in that class. And one of the things we talked a lot about was, you know, it, 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 are there gonna be grades, right? What would even be the point of grades or, or what would those, what would the grading look like? And so what you're seeing on the right, it's not really fully uh, filled out, is just to really show you an example, is how we can take certain types of rubrics and we can make it really uh, differentiated for all different students in the classroom. And so the starting emerging developing, that really comes from Dr. Honigsfeld's book. I really, um, really enjoy her book on multilingual students and uh, language development specifically, but breaking it down to say, okay, I know this student right now, is working on words. You can see that, right? CVC words, consonant, vowel, consonant, caps, hats, maps, caps. I also know they're working on sentences. Um, and in this particular example, they were listening to a sentence and they were writing it down. Um, and so I am going to take that and I'm going to say, okay, I want to show this student their development in uh, words, sentences, speaking, reading, listening, uh, writing, and I'm going to create a rubric based on that. And I'm going to use that particular rubric for this student. And I'm going to use that uh, throughout the class for that because that's where that student is, right? That's where I have to meet the student. Um, we actively chose, just by way of example, not to show the entire rubric because we knew for that student, it would be too overwhelming. It would be too overwhelming to see the starting, emerging, developing, right? Bridging the, the, whole, the whole rubric. Um, and that that particular student would see that and shut down. And so we made the active decision to say, we can be nuanced here, but our purpose for grading is to show growth, right? And, and to give feedback, right? Say, this is where you are. Um, it is to flex again, that growth mindset and muscle. It is to help the student see, right? This is where we're going. This is where we were. Um, and so again, the idea that for multilingual learners in particular, we, we must be nuanced, right? We do have to take a different, a slightly different approach and that allowing them to have different students in your room, allowing them to have different types of rubrics, right? So they're not comparing to each other um, is really a way for them to 
grow in the, their academia themselves. So just to show kind of an example, this is that same student. Now they're in October um, of that year. And um, you can see the student has, um, you know, grown in terms of their academic development sentences, et cetera. They were, uh, this student, um, as you can see, we um, had both home language and English combined together. Um, but at this point, the student, and I'm gonna go back a slide to, just to show you the difference in the rubric, did not meet, we took out that starting column. Right. And so this was kept in a portfolio for that student. It's just, you know, one of those uh, uh, folders uh, in the classroom. And we had specific times set up during the week or the month where we would show this student how far they've come. But when it came to the rubric, they didn't need to have that starting section anymore because that's actually not where they were starting out. So now we're in term two and they're not in starting anymore for, let's say, any of those uh, uh, rows that we were, we had decided. And now we're going to show them emerging, developing, expanding. Now we're going to show them these three uh, to help with, again, the growth and the development and that mindset as well as their um, proficiency. I wanted to show this example because, again, same student, but this is, again, related really to writing. But I wanted to show you on a rubric because I think for many teachers of multilingual students, there's the question of, you know, I'm grading the language development or am I grading content or am I grading both? And how do I not mix both of those together? And how do I make it equitable so that it makes sense? Um, and having rubrics that really break down and again, going back to that purpose of grading is really um, one of the ways to do that. So um, this is really an example of that where we were doing just some sentence work not having to do with uh, the content that we were learning in the classroom, the book we were reading, um, but just doing some sentence work together. And so, you know, I'm showing you this example of the rubric on the right, but I wouldn't have used this exact rubric for this um, uh, for this assignment, I wouldn't have done the content. We weren't working on paragraphs. So they don't, the student doesn't need that, right? It's like extra, it's extra brain work uh, for the student to have to look at that and say, oh, is it this? No, I don't need that in my rubric, right? So again, the flexible, flexible rubric, flexible grading, growth grading, showing you how you've grown from point A to point B, and then how we're going to get to point C um, really allows for our multilingual learners who are so diverse, right, culturally, linguistically, racially, um, to be able to really, um, really, it's keep their humanity um, um, and, and, and approach them in a more holistic way to, uh, when it comes to grading and their and their proficiency when it comes to language um, as well as um, content. So this is that same student um, in March um, that you saw that you've just seen for all of these slides. And this particular student, as you can see, now we've moved that rubric from you know starting. Now we're just doing developing, expanding, bridging. That's where we are. And now we're looking at words, sentences, paragraphs. Again, this is really just a snapshot of an example when it comes to a rubric, but. It's just to show you that we can be flexible. And I, I feel like I'm already hearing from people because I hear this all the time. I remember when we were doing it, when I was doing it in the classroom, it's like, oh, do you create a rubric every single new term? Do you create a rubric for every single student? And this is, this is really where it comes to making it your own and making it, figuring out what the purpose is. So the answer, you know, the short answer to that is no, we didn't make one rubric for every single student in the classroom. Um, we differentiated rubrics. We did change up rubrics depending on the term, depending on the assignment, but we did first take a step back and say, well, what are, what are we um, assessing here? And saying, okay, well, if it's uh, the linguistic, uh, right, the for language development, for example, uh, so I'm gonna use this rubric, which I've already created, um, and maybe I'm just going to take out one section because I know it's going to be too much for that student. But I'm not creating over and over this new rubric for every single assignment. You're all welcome to do that. Uh, but I just wanted to give you a sense when it comes when, you know, I'm sure some of you have in your heads like, oh, well, how did this work practically? Is that we as a team, um, and as I said, I worked in a very collaborative school, uh, would sit down and say, okay, um, this is really what we're looking at. This is our purpose for grading and this is how we're gonna do it. We're gonna have different rubrics for different terms and for different purposes and different assignments. So that's what that really looked like. 
I wanted to show you a reading example specifically for students who may be coming to our classrooms who do not yet have print awareness. And this is really important because oftentimes those are the students who do not receive or do not have the same access um, to, um, I would say, grading that really reflects where they are, right? So we may be thinking about students, I, I've heard from many teachers, right? Like, I don't know what to do. Um, they don't read yet, or I don't know how to teach reading to them, right? I'm not sure what to do. Um, and there are plenty, right, of webinars, plenty of Saddleback, actually really useful one, uh, webinars on that specifically. But I want to see, look at it from the grading perspective is that it's really important for those students to also see their growth, right? Not just in, oh, they're reading out loud and they can hear themselves, but to really on paper, see where they came in and where they've where they are, right, when it comes to reading. And so it's possible that you have a student who comes in who it does not yet have print awareness for whatever reason. And so we're able to say, okay, then I need to create a rubric that's going to show this student um, their development in print awareness. Now I put reading in the, in the next row I just kind of, I, you know, I like I threw reading in there. Reading is obviously a heat, right? We're talking fluency, phonological awareness. You could break it down obviously as needed, but I just wanted to show you an example that though, right? For those students to be able to see their growth and to not shut down and to not feel overwhelmed by the system of grade to say like, yeah, this is, this is growth-based grading. This is how we show you how you grow. Uh, we're here, we might be here right now, but we are going to grow and we're gonna show you that growth. Um, and you're gonna be able to actually see it happening in real time because this is where we're starting but we're going to get to emerging we're going to get to developing and this is the same same type of thing right so in here i've even got some writing and some reading same idea and i might be putting the same maybe this student is in the same classroom as someone else who has print awareness maybe they're reading at their in their home language at that at uh, age grade level and so they need a different rubric right i'm not going to put that print awareness um on that same rubric for them because they don't need it and they don't need to see it and and they don't need to be thinking about oh who in this classroom right needs a print awareness on their rubric um, and so it's really important to think about that in a much more nuanced way of what do the students in this classroom what does each of them need we give students what they need i think it's really important for us to remember that students do not need more reminders of their reading abilities or math abilities compared to their peers and I think this is something that those who teach SLIFE are kind of hyper, maybe even more hyper aware of or extra sensitive to. No one needs that reminder. They know it already, right? An adult also, for example, an adult who does not read, for example, they know, they know they do not read. It's not something they need the reminding of. And so really having that extra sensitivity around grading in the classroom is really important. And not saying like, oh, well, the student doesn't read yet, so I'm just not gonna grade them at all that it's it almost in a way singles them out and we want to avoid that as well we really want to show them like we are going to show you your growth your growth is going to look a little different right than other people it doesn't matter what everyone else is doing this is your growth and so if you look for example these two examples from romeo and juliet specifically we had some students who right they were just circling or some students in the middle who were doing a check box right a check mark that was it students who came in who had not held a pencil maybe from the age of six or seven, and now we're coming in at the age of 17, needed to relearn how to do that. And since they needed to relearn how to do that, expecting them to then write sentences like maybe other students in the classroom and giving them a rubric like that wouldn't really be equitable and it wouldn't be supportive of their development. And we see, you know, time and again, that when we do that to students, it, we get much closer to shutdown. And so we really want to think about how, what is the growth and development? Uh, what is the trajectory for this student, right? And where are they right now? And maybe they're not at this point yet, but we wanna make sure that we have these rubrics, these gr the growth kind of mindset grading that will allow them to get there. Um, I just wanted to show you some examples from my students who I miss very much. Um, these were from, you can see over here, these students are talking about these rubrics over here. We not only spent considerable amount of time as teachers talking about rubrics and planning the rubrics, but also making sure the students are talking to each other about the rubrics, talking to us about the rubrics, working through the rubrics, right? That it everything should be super crystal clear. And so here you have students who are working through this rubric who had the same rubric, uh, we're working on something together, it happens to be, and going through it and talking about that. And so again, just making sure it's super transparent to students what the expectations are, 
really helps with understanding the purpose and the system itself. And then you can see on the left, this student really going through the essay uh, that he was writing that was based on that rubric that you see on the right um, and getting a better sense once that's broken down of in which column and you know where, where everything is making sense on there. Um, the reason why I wanted to uh, point out portfolios um, as we get you know, to the end of the webinar is because we found that webinars really promoted growth-based grading, right? Because then at any time during the year, students can go up to their portfolio. Um, and I don't mean a portfolio, meaning, um, you know, you put one or two, you put three tests in there, or three projects or just projects-based grading, but you're really putting in those rubrics um, as well as assessments and progress monitoring throughout the year so that students at any point can go to them can look at them, can sit down with you as a teacher or uh, you know, a caregiver or the principal or whoever it is um, and say like, this is where I am or where I was and this is where I'm going. Um, and it really allows, again, like I mentioned in the beginning, that growth mindset. It really pushes students to think flexibly um, when it does come to that because most of us are, or anyone really, but particularly when you're think, thinking about um, being in a school where you're learning a target language and maybe you're learning content in a different language, the trajectory, we all know this is teaching multilingual learners, is not linear. It's not just like, oh, you there and you just go like that. It, it's not linear. Um, and, it, and it will look different in how students, um, you know, learn content as well as language, depending on which, what classes they are, depending on so many factors. And so having those uh, portfolios allows them to be able to look at that throughout the year and have those really ongoing and again, nuanced conversations because we want students to have that because that reflects life, right? Life is not linear like that. It allows students to really have a more um, authentic experience in school of what they will experience as well as out of school. So this is the same thing. You can see students here are working through their portfolios. Um, they happen to be, this is an example actually of a DOL that I mentioned before, a defensive learning um, that students presented to each other. Each of those students is using a rubric um, that the student who's presenting has seen, they know, they've been through it. And so they're actually using that rubric. We norm with all of the students as well. So it becomes really uh an experience that's not just for the teachers to norm, but it's really for all of the students to norm as well. So it's like everyone's on the same page, everyone is consistent. So I wanted to end with some um, questions for grading reflection and process specifically. Um, you know, in the time that we have, it's not enough to fully unpack this topic, but to really show that for any student, but more specifically for our multilingual learners, the first one is understanding what is the purpose of this grading? What, like, what is the purpose? What is the purpose on a whole, right? For the whole school, for this class? What is the purpose for this particular student? Who does it serve, right? Who does this grading serve? Does it serve the students, right? Are our practices humanizing and are they equitable? Am I looking at my whole student? Am I looking at all the nuances that this student brings to the classroom, right? Am I looking at all of their experiences that they're bringing to the classroom? And am I supporting that through my grading? Are our practices supporting a growth mindset? So again, am I helping my students flex that muscle, right? It's, it's, it, they're learning, right? They're learning to do that. They're learning to have a growth mindset. It's, it's about building that muscle in the brain. Um, now that let's say you've decided on the purpose of your grading, how are you actually measuring? And then how are you reporting it, right? What, what do those two systems look like? What or vehicles look like once you've decided on the system? Um, is there coherence in grading throughout the school, right? Because it doesn't really work if one teacher, you know, norms and decides on one grading practice and another one doesn't. I recognize this is really challenging. This can be really challenging getting everyone on board on the same, um, the same grading practice, the same purpose. And then how will we disseminate the information to students and their families about our grading practices, right? It's not, it is, it, sure, it's what we're doing in the school and it is impacting our students, but it's not just students, it's, it's our families, it's our school community, it's our community beyond the school. It's how do we, um, explain that information? How do we give that information? And that's something that we really want to try and do as early as possible, right? It's not just when parents come in, let's say, or a phone call or, or message, right? Um, it's saying, this is how we grade. This is why we grade. This is why it is going to be supportive of your child who is here, right? And so being able to do that uh, really makes a huge difference for families to understand, um, especially for our newcomers and many of our multilingual students, um, who have experienced the system very differently than their monolingual peers to be able to really 
uh, understand why the school is doing what they're doing um, and how it is fully supportive of their students. Um, so I wanted to, whatever, I would love to answer questions. I'm just looking at time, okay. I would love to answer questions and I'd love to let everyone know that we are having a virtual SLIFE conference this year that we would love to see you all at. Um, and um, I'm gonna open the chat. Or Liz, there's Liz been, if you see any, yeah. <laughs> oh, there's been lots of fun things going on in the chat. Um, so, uh, but yes, the virtual SLIFE conference, check it out. Lots of great featured speakers, uh, many of whom you've seen on our webinar series. So, you know, they're fabulous and they always have a lot of uh, very useful and uplifting information to share. So we encourage you to check that out and we'd love to see you there. Um, so in the chat, uh, Orly, one of the things uh, I just kind of want to bring you up to speed what's been going on. Um, <laughs> Regina had shared that she develops um, rubrics using the stang stages of second language acquisition and levels of English language proficiency um, and sort of disseminates them to staff or teachers she works with as a means of maintaining consistency, right? So kind yeah. of utilizing that information and, and building and flexing uh, to, to make um, rubrics, which I think it'd be really cool actually to see um, th those rubrics next to your um, reflection and process questions. Um, and I'm leave that up to Regina, whether or not she <laughs> wants to do that. So, uh, but there have been a lot of people in the chat who are like, oh, can I see those? I'd love to see those and hashtag better together. And, um, you know, just, awesome. it's, it's always easier to start a new project if you have a blueprint that somebody else can hand you and yeah. you can sort of tinker with it as opposed to creating something from scratch. So yeah. there, there's a lot of that going on on the side. Like I do this, can I see that? You know, so um, I do, yeah, I do think it would be neat to, um, uh, to, to lay those reflection questions next to any, any rubrics that people have created for um, this purpose, any, anything that's sort of in the ballpark of what you're talking about and to see if any shifts would, would occur. So um, anyhow. That's great. That's, that's uh, great. That's, yeah, that's that really, really amazing. Cool. Yeah. Um, let me see. We did have a couple of questions that uh, came in. And one was from Robert. And Robert has actually asked this question to previous um, webinar presenters. And of course, I can't remember exactly what their answer was. <laughs> and this is, it's an interesting question when it comes to um, grading or getting feedback or um, being able to kind of assess where students' um, thinking is in terms of their own learning. What about students rating or evaluating their teachers in secondary mm. schools like they would, like their counterparts in a college classroom, right? So is that something that would be valuable in terms of a reflection process for them on what they receive versus what could be done differently? Or is that just too, we, is that gonna cause overwhelm? What do you think? I personally uh, think it's a great, um, a great process for students to go through. Um, because I think it's a way for them to, first of all, I, I think the question is great. Thank you for bringing it up. But I think it's um, valuable for students to be able to say, this really did not work for me, you know, in a, in a really, re you know, respectful, you frame it way, but for students to be able to figure out what does work or what doesn't work for them or why or why not. I also think it's really um, valuable for them because it allows for students uh, to say, you know, to like own up in the sense, take ownership, right, of their own learning and to be able to say that, you know, again, this worked for me or like, yep, you know what, um, like in my teacher reflection or or recognizing what is working for me with this teacher, it's like, well, I, I was absent for let's say 10 days. Let's say it wasn't there, you know, for no fault of their own, but it's like, I was absent and here's what I really needed, right? Um, or whatever it is. And so I think that's really useful. And I think in general, teacher feedback is really, important for teachers to hear from the students that they're serving. So, you know, I, I personally am a big fan of it. I think um, I, that really also lends itself to the question of like classroom culture, you know, mm -hmm. um, I, you know, feeling, uh, uh, feel, psychologic, being, feeling psych psychologically safe, um, you know, so I think it really brings up questions about that, uh, which yeah. is like not this webinar, but, um, you know, I, that, but in general, I would say that if you have that within a classroom and you've created that, I, th I think they're great. Yeah, it's a, it is a great question and it, 
it opens up lots of other questions too. Yeah. So yeah. it would be, you're right. It's a different webinar, but um, <laughs> there definitely needs to be a certain cult, classroom culture in place um, yeah. for students to be able to feel like they can be, you know, um, forthcoming with, with what they need and advocating for themselves and, and that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah. so that's, um, that's a good point. Okay. Um, there was a question that came in about um, uh, Courtney. Great question. So what can advocacy around this look like in a district that is standards-based in their grading approach? I mean, we know as teachers that we should, it's more beneficial for us, for, for the students, for us to make these sorts of shifts. But, you know, at the end of the day, I need to enter the grades in or, or I have to adhere to the, the system, right? You, and you addressed this earlier a little bit, you touched on it. So yeah. um, let's, let's circle back to that and see what Yeah, you sure. Um, it's a great question. And I, it's, it's one of those things that, um, you know, we recently, we meaning in our learning recently um, uh, started working with someone around um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we were talking about just kind of the system that we work in in education in general. Um, and she said to us, you know, it's really important to think about um, structures, not systems. And that really stayed with me because you, you know, you work in this district, the, there is it, advocacy work is really important. And at the same time, also recognizing that the whole district is probably not changing their grading system, like one, two, three, the way that it should be. Um, and so what are the structures in the school or in an, in, or in individual classrooms that even though, let's say the district uses one certain grading system um, that you would like them to shift away from, um, how can we change some of those structures to maybe reflect a different grading system, even when even within this system? Um, I think when it does come to advocacy, um, you know, different knowing different people and who to start those conversations with. And sometimes within a district, that means just starting within a one individual school um, and getting one that one person on board to start there. Um, and then you know, working with them to have that conversation with someone else in the district. Thank you. And thank you, Allison, for dropping that link in the chat uh, for us. Some people are um, kind of struggling to get that link to the virtual life conference. So Allison to the rescue. Oh, thank thank you. you. That's why I love our, you. our group. Uh, you know, but like we said earlier, hashtag better together, right? Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's true. Uh, it's really true. Thanks, Allison. Okay. I mean, I think I got all the questions, but if I didn't, um, why don't you all take a minute to add any more questions that you can think of uh, while I go ahead and take the screen share back um, and let everybody know about our next webinar, which our next webinar is, y'all are just going to be stuck with me next time, but no, that's okay. Um, so our next webinar, which is not next week, but the week after, uh, we're just going to take some time uh, probably about 30 minutes or so to share with you um, a, a very new and exciting um, supplemental library that we have here at Saddleback. It's called Go SEL Literacy Library. This is what it looks like, and it is for upper elementary and middle school students, and it is all around um, social and emotional skills, and it's a high-low. They're high-low because it's a Saddleback book. Lots of emphasis on vocabulary and supporting um, language and, and um, communication around um, emotion vocabulary. So uh, it's a it's a really great resource. And we just wanted to take a, a webinar slot to kind of tell you about it. So you can register on our website or you'll be receiving an email as usual um, for uh, our next webinar. And then after that, we'll have um, uh, Carly and Jody, Carly Spina and uh, Jody Nelf will be co-presenting um, after, after that one. So later on in the month, we'll go uh, back to having our guest presenters. So let me just double check any more questions. Oh, Allison says the the link to the, the Bitly isn't um, oh, going to the right working. place. I see that. Yeah, but, yeah. But the QR code works. So, okay. uh, but the correct link is in the chat, and you can also go to Inlier Learning's website, and there will be information there too for uh, for signing up for the conference. So, thank you for that. Sorry about that. Yeah, sorry uh, about that. that yeah, yes, I apologize. Um, that That's is okay. An old, that is an old link. I apologize about that. That is a okay. We've got it in the chat for anybody. I know. Who Thank you, it. Allison. I see her. She's on it. Thank you. Yeah, she's on it. Thanks, <laughs> Allison. We need that. I think we got all the questions answered for today. And this the Slife information for the Slife conference is on the website. And um, <laughs> Allison. <laughs> um, and if I missed your question, I don't think I did. But if we did, 
um, just uh, email me and we'll make sure to get your questions answered. Orly, you are amazing. Courtney says, Orly, you're amazing. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thank, you. thank you for having me. I love, I, you know, yes. I love doing these with you. Yeah. And thank you so much. And we hope to see you next time for our webinar on the new Go SEL books. They're really great. I think you will enjoy learning about them. And everybody have a great rest of your week and we will see you next time. Take care. Bye everybody. Bye.